Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. My name is Andrew Townsend. I'm the Campaign Marketing Manager with eLearning Brothers. Today's session is going to be about telecommuting like a rock star during and after coronavirus. To talk to us about these, uh, this topic, we have uh, special guest Stephanie Ivick, our Content Manager, Monica Newell, our Associate Instructional Designer, Colin Angus, the Custom Solutions Consultant, and Missy Harding, our Senior Learning Consultant. And what do all of these people have in common? They've been remote workers for a very long time, not just a week or two like uh, like some of us. So they're going to be sharing some really great information uh, about uh, how to do this effectively and how to do this well. This session will be recorded. We will send a copy of it out to everybody who has registered for the session. So you can be checking for that in your email later today. We'll also likely be posting this on our blog, so you can come and, and revisit that at blog.elearningbrothers.com. All right, so this is going to kind of be a panel discussion, uh, not quite an open mic, but we would like to hear from you. You can use the questions panel in your GoToWebinar control panel and uh, send in messages here. And it uh, looks like some of you have already found that. So do try to communicate there, and, uh, and we'll get to as many of your questions and comments as we can. All right, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn the time over to Colin and, and, and uh, Monica and the rest of the team to talk about uh, the benefits, why working from home, uh, why were you working from home before, are there benefits, what are the cons to working from home, and then just try to, to open up that conversation. Uh, so who, who would like to jump into that first? I think, Colin, you had some ideas. I mean, you, you've probably been working from home the longest, isn't that right? Yeah, uh, totally happy to jump on in here. And, uh, and so, actually, if you listen carefully, there's 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 a, a work from home thing. Uh, so it's one o'clock, and sure enough, the mailman has just arrived. We have a little mail slot, drop the mail in, and now the dog is eating it um, in front of oh I don't know what do we have here a hundred or so people right. So anyways, um, hi everyone. I am Cullen Angus, uh, and I am a solutions consultant uh, here at eLearning Brothers. So yeah, um, Andrew absolutely invited me to be part of the panel as he heard that I've actually been doing um, work from home for, uh, for a whole lot of years. And really just to kind of sort of, you know, give my perspective on things just for a few minutes. Um, you know, it, it's interesting, but my very first work from home position does go back to uh, 1996. Um, and so if you might imagine then, that um, my experiences work from home, it was as a single person um, working from a kitchen table, um, as a father with little babies, and I would sequester myself in a tiny room. Um, and now, as, uh, as an individual who has a, a, a son who's a senior in high school and my daughter is uh, in her third year of college, so, um, so, you know, with all these experiences, uh, they've all been very different. But throughout, um, the benefits um, really have outweighed any of the challenges, like a docking, uh, barking dog in the background. Um, and those benefits, sure, they have been for me. But without question, they've also been for the, for the employer as well. So really just, just to point out a few. Um, in 2000 is when I really started in learning and development and providing these uh, complex um, custom learning solutions. I've always been here in Connecticut. Um, I'm about an hour outside of New York City. And I've really just had the great fortune to work for a number of L&D shops in Canada, in Ireland, in India, and of course here in, in the States. New York City is a very desirable market, um, and with quick access from Connecticut, and uh, as a remote employee, not having to pay overhead in New York City, well, it, it, it then becomes, you know, more desirable. So, um, and uh, being on the East Coast, um, uh, I had a, uh, a better time zone, to, you know, to that of um ireland and india right so that that's just kind of added you know to the organization these different companies are a reason for wanting to stick somebody in this particular area um but uh so th there's obviously a handful of reasons why you know some organizations you know uh do go with um uh remote employees but nonetheless 
on the personal side of things, um, back in 2008 through 2013, you know, I, I actually had an office in downtown New York City, but I would really, um, I guess for about a period of about six months, I only went in uh, about twice a week, um, which eventually turned into only twice a month. But it, when you think about this, between um, parking, train, subway, you go to Starbucks once, you go out to lunch, it was every bit of a hundred dollar day um, for that. And then, um, you know, that of course doesn't take care of, take into consideration all the other things, you know, suits and dry cleaning and so on and so forth. So there's obviously that sort of, you know, benefit. Um, but uh, the, really the big one was my day was basically, well, 6 a.m. to 7 p.m., you know, door to door. Um, and, and no no doubt, you know, four hour, a good four hours was completely, you know, unproductive um, as a result of that uh, commute. Um, so between, you know, the uh, the cost aspect of it and the time that you get back, you know, it really just has been, you know, immeasurable um, to be a remote worker. And um, but I want to leave you with, with, with two thoughts. Um, really, um, in my opinion, the biggest one being that um, I feel that uh, when working from home, um, I feel that with my clients, with my coworkers, especially when we're using video, right? You know, video is just so popular, and I, and I highly, highly recommend that, um, you know, tip number one, that you become video first. Right. Um, I do feel that, you know, when the video is on, um, you get these visual cues. Um, and I think sometimes these cues, uh, these visual cues that you wouldn't otherwise get um, when just having a phone call or, or even being in the office. Right. Um, you know, these visual cues can strengthen the relationship and ultimately lead to trust and just more connected tissue. Um, you know, between the two folks. Uh, I mean, you know, I don't know if you can notice it. My hat says UConn, right? Um, uh, stems the conversation, right? Did you go to UConn? Uh, my daughter went to UConn. What about the pictures in the background? You know, uh, my wife and I, we bought them when we were in France. Um, so it's just, you know, these visual cues, I think, really do lend to um, connect the tissue. And that's really what we're, we're all trying to achieve, right? I mean, that's why this, this big question has come up. How do we remain connected? Uh, and so I, I really do think that um, when you're in a personal environment, um, that sort of connectivity can really happen um, in a way that, that just really gets you to know uh, the person that you're speaking to. Um, and the other big one that I thought as well, of course, this one is, is super personal to me. Um, you know, it was actually my daughter that happened to say to me, because um, uh, I was telling her that I was doing this, and she basically, you know, made a comparison um, where she said that, you know, Dad, when I think about uh, my other friends and how much time their dad spends at the office, um, you know, she just said, listen, you've always been there uh, for me. And, uh, and us, you know, the family in general. Um, and isn't that what it's all about, right? I mean, what, what better benefit could you possibly think of than to have one of your kids say, you've always been there? And I would definitely a, agree. There's a comment here uh, from the audience, when has video not been helpful? You know, I mean, being able to, to share your video and have a conversation has always been uh, something that, I mean, well, not always. It has grown and become very, very important and very, very useful. Uh, thank heavens for high-speed internet. Uh, what are your yeah. thoughts on that one, Monica? Um, I mean, there are definitely, we you know, all have those instances where we have video going and our technology cuts out or our bandwidth is slow, and so it actually kind of breaks up the communication because you think you're showing one screen and that screen is lagging, and so that definitely becomes challenging in terms of communication. But I think ultimately um, the ability to be on the same page in terms of displaying what it is that you're talking about, um, being able to point to specific elements in content and talk about that, 
and also the visual cues of seeing an individual's face, seeing how they're responding to what you're saying. And because meetings are so reliant upon that, um, being able to see that visually, video has been a huge boon. I will say Excellent. it's not helpful when meetings are scheduled over your lunch and you really just want to be eating like a giant messy salad, but you can't because you're on video. But um, for me, my team has daily video calls every morning. And when I first joined the team, that was really important for me since I had never actually been to the eLearning Brothers office before I started. So I hadn't met any of these people in person. So having those daily video calls to get to know my coworkers and get in the groove was really helpful. Of course, video does take away one of the, you know, best advantages of working from home, which is looking like a hobo. So if you, <laughs> you want to be on video, all of you got to get up, you got to get up and get ready and you can still wear your jammy pants, but. You only have to get dressed from here up. You're fine. <laughs> I don't know. You got to be prepared. You might have to stand up to get something on a video call, and then people will be like, yeah. "Oh, those are some nice sweatpants, Stephanie. How long have you had those since high school?" Why, well, yes. Yeah. Thank you. I have. They're very comfy. Well, and I, I think it's helpful too for for people for organizations that are new to it. It's great to put out some standards. Hey guys, you know we kind of know what our norms and values are for meetings, but here are our norms and values for working from home. So. Our expectation is we're all going to be on video. We're all going to turn it on. I've noticed that with some of the clients that we've worked with where, you know, we at ELB, we don't do it as much. And then I'll log into a client call and suddenly here's a whole team of people that are on camera. And I'm like, it's a hobo day over here. So I'm not prepared for that because it's not, you know, not necessarily part of our norms. But um, video and there's a lot of other things too that I think that if someone puts some thought into it and even publishes something out and kind of sets a standard it can help you guys get up and rolling a little faster with things like video there's other stuff too but I think so and I think especially if you're new to working remotely it can be intimidating because now you're faced with these people who who perhaps might have been working remotely much longer than you and so video kind of highlights the the fact that now you are facing these individuals who perhaps might have a lot more experience and that might be kind of unnerving so I think um, especially those who are starting out working remotely or it's new to them, it, it's much more comforting not to be on video because then you have a little bit of a buffer. So I, I definitely understand why that's the tendency. Well, and video, I think, you know, Cohen mentioned connective tissue, the social connective tissue, but video is also a great way to help keep people engaged. Um, so mm -hmm. if I'm multitasking right now, it's going to be pretty obvious to you guys. <laughs> So a lot of people multitask through meetings, but if you have video on, they're much more um, apt to give you their attention and to not be doing that or to be going and making a sandwich and just leaving the call. And um, sure. they're tempted, they're very, very tempted to do that otherwise. So video is helpful that way too. And kind of going to that, uh, to that uh, question of earlier, um, you know, when has it not been good? Um, you know, I, for me, it really just kind of comes down to, um, uh, to knowing uh, the technology. And so I could not, you know, encourage people enough that you've got to play around with it. And, and you know, here's a great point. Uh, we're using, uh, what is it? This is GoToMeeting uh, for this. You know, internally, we've also been using Zoom. So you get really used to it and you kind of lose track of, uh, you know, where's this button or the other button. Um, you know, and ever since, you know, some of the schools that at where I am, you know, some of the schools have closed down, and, and my son, um, he's actually here, you know, upstairs, and they're doing video. They're using um, uh, Google Hangouts, and uh, holy cow, you know, the right wires and getting him set up, and so the messaging really just being, you know, really get to know it and and play around with it and and try it as as much as you can, and, and do know where the cables are to everything, because you might have to reconfigure at a last, at a, you know, at a moment's notice. And always know where the mute button is. Just in yeah, case. knowing where the mute button and where the the, the camera turn off button is. Uh, there's a couple of comments coming in from the audience. Um, this person says, "I'm brand new to working remotely, and our boss doesn't ever want us to use video. And I'm finding that I have trouble focusing on what's being shared uh, and listening at the same time." Um, so yeah, just having something to look at and keep your focus has helped a lot to uh, to make sure that meetings are being followed and paid attention to. 
Um, well, Andrew, so, I would just say if your boss is anti-video and you're struggling to focus on something, I would encourage you to take notes. And that does give you something to visually focus on and to break it down. And I'm a big time note taker. I'll even after meetings, I'll share my notes with people. Hey, these are my notes, you know, or what I know. <laughs> big nerd. But um, it does notes, get... not even everybody else's. <laughs> so um, that could help you. <laughs> for sure. So note taking. There's another comment here. Are, are there any tips for preparing your home environment? I'm on my kitchen table and my house is a mess because I'm, while I'm home, I'm working, I'm not house cleaning. Uh, we shared several uh, videos on LinkedIn this week um, as a marketing team with some some of these work from home tips that have helped us to be more effective. And uh, Stephanie, do you want to dive into some other, I mean, you've been working from home for quite some time as well. What are some effective ways of making sure that wherever you are, you're being effective at home? Yes, definitely. So um, when I first started working from home, I was living in a very small apartment, so I completely understand Struggling to carve out a space. So even if it is the end of your dining table, try to make yourself a little setup where you have everything you need right at hand and it can stay there. Like this can be your permanent setup for the next month or however long you are doing this. So you've got space for your computer, you've got your notepad, you have a comfortable chair. I'm very passionate about ergonomics. The chair matters. So if you don't want to go out and get an office chair, that's totally fine if this is temporary for you. But even, you know, getting a little pillow or something like a lower back cushion, just something to make sure you are comfortable for sitting there for long periods of time. And I have, we shared a video this week where um, our director of marketing has stacked up books to raise up his screen so he's not hunched over all the time like a little turtle. You don't want to do that. The first couple of days it's fine, and you're like, oh, I can I can manage this. But eventually, um, my husband also recently started working from home, and we only have one desk chair, which is clearly mine. And <laughs> he is now starting after like a week or so, it's definitely feeling the effects of the dining chair. So that's one of my biggest tips: is make a comfortable ergonomic setup. I have many more thoughts on ergonomics, but I want to let other people also share their tips too. I think it's so funny that uh, you know we've we've had these office chairs at, at at work at the office at the at the office building for so long and we haven't noticed these issues and then we suddenly we come home and nothing in our house is good enough even if it's like the same chair it might not even feel the same and it's because we're not getting up we're not going to talk to Brad in his office we're not going to to fight someone over the last donut or something, you know? I mean, you're just not moving as much. You're stuck in this chair all day and you really start to feel it. Um, are there any other comments on, on trying to stay comfortable at work, maybe from Colin? Yeah, so um, listen, I, I certainly wouldn't want to, understanding that, that this is likely a temporary um, situation for a number of folks, I, I definitely wouldn't want to send you away with a, with a laundry list of things um a shopping list of things uh but um you know i would definitely want to add that um my life definitely changed um for the better um when i picked up a i don't know maybe 12 dollar wireless uh keyboard um it just made my posture better which is a huge thing you know throughout the day and um you know, for many years, I did just work off of a laptop um, and uh, having that extra monitor. Oh, my goodness. What, 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 a, what a help. Right. I mean, you know, I'm wearing glasses. I've only had them for like four years. <laughs> so it's really still kind of new to me. But um, I don't know, you know, squinting and, and trying to use the keyboard it's way out over here. Um, you know, again, don't want to send you away with a, with a laundry list. but. Um, yeah, I think there are a handful of little things that uh, are definitely worth looking into. Can I Stephanie, just ask, is there a place um, where people can... I was just going to say, Steph, do you have a place where people can go look up some ergonomic tips? Um, do I? I can put the blog about it. That was, people, I, you know I wasn't baited. I'm it's, genuinely curious. It's like, wait, did, did we do a blog about that? I don't remember. If people are interested, I can definitely do a little roundup and post it in the recap of this webinar. It'll be on our blog next week. All right, awesome. Sorry, Misty, I'll shut my mouth. 
Well, I'm just, I'm kind of pivoting off of that to something different when we talk about setting up your environment. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that are, you know, kind of in little rat holes all over their house trying to work. One of the things that's, so aside from ergonomics and, 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 and efficiency, um, there are, and I found this a lot working from home over the years in various situations, there is something to be said for setting a visual expectation for others in your home that you're at work. And so obviously having a private space or a place where you can shut the door is ideal. But even if not, if you have a work setup and people understand I am working now, um, you know, I have an office, but I work all over the house and I get treated like I'm just home, you know, if I'm not clearly working. And one of the things people struggle the most with when they, and this is a whole topic that we could chat about, but um, is still being effective at home when there are others with you. Uh, even alone, people struggle. How do you not turn on the TV? How do you not constantly go to the pantry? How do you? Um, and so I'm a big believer in the discipline of time and the discipline of environment. So because otherwise, everything starts to bleed together, right? Your kid wants to go play with you. for Your kids are home. You know, a lot of your kids are out of school. And your kid wants to go play because they don't realize you're working. Um, so the, the visual, the physical barrier and then even the discipline of time um, can help with some of that. And again, I think we could talk, I, there's a ton that I could say about how to create that discipline if people are asking questions or have comments about it. But. And I do, I also wanted to add in terms of just visual cues um, that my earbuds have become invaluable to me. Um, that if I'm, I have a working space at home and it's separate and I can't close the door, I have an office, however, my internet is very wonky and there are times when I end up at the library. And one of my absolute go-to items is even if I'm not listening to music because I need to be thinking, I need to be processing, I still put my earbuds in. They're always in when I'm working and so it's that visual cue if I'm at the library or if I'm at home that I'm working and I'm focused and you can't talk to me right now. So I always have my earbuds in when I'm working because it creates that separation. It's a small thing, but I've noticed that it's very effective. And so that's just something that I do. Awesome. Yeah. Some comments on earbuds real quick is that uh, if you are going to be wearing earbuds for long periods of time, please clean your earbuds and your ears often because that can drive to uh, ear infections. I ran into that all the time at my last job where I wore earbuds 100% of the time and it was gross. So yeah, keep them clean, take them out, keep your ears clean, be healthy. Uh, I, I would certainly second the, uh, well actually third then I guess, uh, the notion of the earbuds. I certainly have them in now. And for me, um, I do that primarily because I know where the mute button is on this thing. I can hit it quickly. And if you are working with, you know, go to or, or Zoom or whatever, you know, you have internally um, connect and my goodness, there's so many of them out there. Um, yeah, finding it sometimes, you know, and sometimes your mouth might not be right near you where you can grab it. So I would definitely agree with that. But I think the other thing to it is, you know, so um, we've been reading, there's a million articles out, right? You know, how should you know, you, you know, what are the best practices for working at home? And we read a lot about, you know, get up, walk around every five minutes. Um, with the earbuds, um, I do think taking advantage of the call-in number versus using the audio, um, you know, I prefer to get up and actually walk around while I'm having a phone call. You know, I mean, we, you know, internally here, um, we do have every day, you know, look at it as a scrum, you know, it's great to stand up and walk around and get to your point really quickly. So um, I think it's, it's a better idea to always use, you know, the, uh, the headphones. Um, so that way you can walk around and that way, for me at least, you know, I can grab that mute button pretty quickly. Sure, sure. Um, there's two, uh, well, a couple, a couple comments here. Um, jumping back to ergonomics, that was a popular uh, comment. So, uh, some of us have been interested in er ergonomics before the current uh, crisis uh, jumped on us, and so we have the luxury of really nice ergonomic chairs or really nice ergonomic keyboards or mice, as Stephanie has. Um, if we don't really have that luxury, if you know we go to order a chair and it looks like it's three weeks out before Amazon can deliver it to us or whatever, what are some workarounds, some ways to get fairly good ergonomics immediately? Any ideas on that? 
I used to be an orientation trainer, and this is something that we would talk with people about. There's some great just free resources on the internet that help you to understand. It's not about specific equipment. It's about creating certain angles, right? Certain 90 degree angles and certain, and there's stuff all over. There's little drawings of, of little dudes in chairs. And I, so I think if you even just did a quick Google search to see some of that stuff, then it becomes, well, how do I create it? Right now, my laptop is sitting on a storage box you know, to create a, <laughs> an, there's lots of things that you can do to raise your monitors and to, um, my husband has been working from home now. He, his workstation is next to mine and he has a literal pillow from our bed sitting in his chair. And he said, this chair is awful. And I, he doesn't care because he doesn't usually sit in it, but now he does. So he's adjusted with a pillow. So I think if you were to just go and look at the guidelines, you could find some creative ways to try to meet those angles, certain posture and certain angle. And he did order like a little, um, gel because he's noticing with the height of the chair and the height of our desk he's having to stretch and his wrist is hanging over the edge of the uh the table and it's and it's hurting him and so we're just making little adjustments like that um okay moving on actually one other comment here so uh there's a there's an issue going around where people when you're in the office it's good practice as a leader to have open door policy times right so even if they're even like you know what from one to three my door is open you guys can visit me whenever you like how how are, is that being managed as as everybody's working from home how do you have a digital open door policy for for quality communication I'd like to address that because that was definitely something I struggled with when I started. Um, I would have multiple threads for multiple projects. And as soon as somebody commented, I felt like I needed to respond immediately. And so that was something that I needed to kind of start prioritizing which projects needed to be addressed um, immediately. Uh, and then I kind of realized through conversation that there was more of a company expectation that things would be addressed when they could and they didn't have to be immediately addressed. And so that was helpful if I'm in the middle of a project and I haven't got a, a thought process going on, I can't stop what I'm doing. Um, so I do use the, the don't disturb feature that will turn off notifications. And then when I'm done with my project, and I try to check it um, hourly is usually uh, about the time that I'll check it if I'm working on something specifically that really needs my attention and I don't want to distract myself. Um, otherwise, if I'm working on smaller projects, I might check it more frequently. So that was definitely something that I had to kind of figure out what is the expectation. And um, so I think companies being open about what they expect is very helpful. And then also finding a, a pace uh, that works for you as to how often do you check email and how often do you check your um, you know, company messenger. Uh, Andrew, also, it's, oh, go ahead, Stephanie. Oh, well, I was just going to say for managers, if they want to still kind of have that open door time using Google Calendar or Apple Calendar, like whatever calendar your organization is using, having that time blocked off and making sure, you know, you block out when you're busy, when you're in a meeting, when you will be available so that everybody knows and they're not messaging you waiting on a response when you're actually in a meeting and they just don't know that. So making it very visible when you're available. And I think in addition to that, as a manager or a leader of teams, um, you can, first of all, be having scheduled one-on-ones with people. You may have not felt the need for that in the past because you chatted so frequently or you're a small team, but letting, have some, letting somebody have a calendared set aside time whether it needs to be every couple of days or once a week is helpful and they can kind of save their issues that aren't urgent until that time and they can get the one-on-one -on -one attention. Um, I've even done it before, um, like when massive projects are going on and people need, I'll set aside an hour each day and just say, listen, I am sitting here waiting. You know, I'm manning this chat or I'm actually gonna log into Zoom and I'm gonna sit there. And if you wanna come chat with me, I'm there. So there's lots of creative ways that you can do that by making yourself available and publicizing it. And then and then supplementing that with what Monica talked about with having uh, having kind of published policies and ways of working. Awesome, okay, we're gonna pivot a little bit. I'm gonna launch this poll. Um, it's a poll that we put on our website a day or two ago and we've had a surprisingly uh, large amount of responses here, but um, the poll is how prepared is your organization to support training for a remote workforce? Um, this is for, you know, how, how, how prepared 
was your was your team when it came to say, okay, well, we can't do any more ILT, we can't do any more classroom training. It's all got to be we've got to figure out some way to do it digitally. How prepared was your organization uh, for that change, or how prepared is it right now? I'd love to see your comment uh, or your, your your voting in the polls. Just click directly on the screen. But while people are uh, participating here, what would you assume the 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 responses are going to be, uh, panel? I think there's going to be a lot of uh, somewhat prepared in that as technology has become more readily available, companies have been trying to use it to keep their workforce more connected. But I think a lot of companies are, are used to having that face-to-face -face option, um, either as the, the large percentage of interaction or the most reliable form of interaction. So I'm leaning towards somewhat is my guess. I'm going to go with uh, not very, and the reason why I say this is, um, so, uh, well, it's no secret that, you know, we are an L&D, you know, uh, shop. Um, you know, I would say a large percentage of all of the RFPs that come in uh, are how do we do this, right? How do we move from an ILT to a, a VILT? So, uh, there's a surprising large number that come in with that very question. So I'm mean, going not very prepared. There's a comment here. My company has never permitted work from home or flex time, and we are scrambling right now to pivot around COVID. I'm currently converting ILT courses to virtual delivery. So, uh, yeah, that supports a lot of what you're, you're saying here, Colin. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Let's take a look at these results, the percentages here. So. 51% uh, said that they're somewhat prepared, 27% very prepared, 17% uh, not very prepared, and 4% not prepared at all. So you're definitely right, Monica. There's 51% somewhat prepared. Uh, that's that's the vast majority of our audience here. So uh, that being said, Misty, I am super curious what you would say about those who are trying to convert, get their training online. What what do you need to know? What are the key? If you're if you're brand new to it, if you've just been an in-person trainer and suddenly you're like, all right, go get it virtual. What what do they need to know? Well, and I wonder if some of the somewhat prepared is on the technology side. So yes, we have a tool like Zoom. Yes, we have an LMS. Um, but what is the level of personal preparedness that some of these individuals have at you no longer have the option to do face-to-face -face training and so um, part of it is you're going to have what's the technology that's keeping me from reaching people but then part of it also is how do i realign the way that i think about um, training something so that it can be done virtually and let me tell let me give you an example of what i mean by that so, and I have a blog article out there. I don't know what it's called. Maybe we can send it out in the roundup, but it's called something like how to convert instructor-led training to online. I have like a picture and a model and a something, something. We'll send it out. But let me give you an example of, of just what it talks about. So, um, in, the, in the way old days, I used to be an HR trainer and we would train uh, something like sexual harassment. And we had this super fun activity that we did because of course, when you're training sexual harassment, you're trying to help people understand, hey, everybody sees this differently. And we have to recognize that what you might think is okay is not okay to another person. And we have to become more aware of that. And so we did this super fun activity where we would, I would have everybody stand up and I would go through a couple of different examples. So I would say, all right, um, a boss comes in in the morning and see a, a male boss comes in and sees a female worker and comes up and gives her a squeeze on the shoulder and says, that's a really good looking top, you know? And I said, okay, now I wanna know how you feel about this. Do you feel like that's okay? Like totally acceptable? I want you to go stand on this side of the wall. If you're not sure if it's okay, I want you to stand in the middle. And if you think that there's nothing wrong with it, I want you to go stand over there in that corner. And everybody would scatter. And guys, there were always people in all three spots, by the way. 
And as other people saw where other people were standing, it started to produce a lot of really good discussion. And we'd go through several, you know, some some not quite so much that way. And people would move and then I would interview them. I'd say, okay, from the group in the middle, help, help me understand why you're not sure. And then we would have a great conversation about it. And so by the time we went through this seven, eight, nine, ten 10 times, we had really made a really impactful point. It took 20 minutes, but we did it. And it was one of our main points. Well, then they came to me and said, you need to put this online. Well, how am I going to have people stand against the wall if you're making me do this online, right? And so what I learned over time was, okay, I have to work, you kind of almost have to reverse engineer your ILT in order to then put it online or to do it virtually if you want to, right? So what I would, and this is what I have in the blog article. There's a little kind of conversion model worksheet that you can kind of use, but it has you start by identifying what was awesome about what you were doing in ILT and what was the point? So what was someone doing? What was someone thinking? What was someone feeling when you were doing it that way? And so you write that down. Um, well, you write down what you would do in ILT, then in the next column, it's what were they thinking or feeling or doing, and then you say, how could I create that same thing in a different way? So for example, let's say we wanted to do that in this webinar. So what I could do is that I could create a slide that has this scenario up at the top, and I could put a scale. And if our, I don't know, if does GoToMeeting have an annotation? If your tool has annotation, then you could ask everybody to annotate. They could put little stars or hearts or dots or arrows on one side or in the middle or on the other side, and you can still have all that same great conversation, right? Or if you need to do it in e-learning, you could do it, a com which is asynchronous, you could do it in a completely different way. So I did one, when I converted this to online training, I actually chose to use a stoplight activity. So there was uh, a little snippet and then next to it was a stoplight and they would click red, yellow, or green um, to kind of give their indication. And any, anyway, I had a whole way that I did it. They don't have to stand against a wall, but for whatever reason, when you're new to this process, that's all you can think about because that activity was so great or we get so much out of this discussion. Or, and I testify to you as someone who's been doing it for 20 years, there is always a way to do it differently. And so that's the thing that you have to start thinking about how can I do it differently? So part of that is your technology. What technology do you have and what's available to you? But part of it is being willing to give some things up. You may have to give, if it's totally asynchronous and remote, you're giving up discussion. But what can you replace it with? For example, sometimes what we'll do is we'll say, we want you to think about this. We want you to take the time. So it's sales training, Colin. Let's say it's sales training, right? And we're saying, how would you, um, how would you pitch a close to a customer or whatever? We give you the background. We let you take the time to write it in. And then on the next screen, you're going to compare your answer to an expert answer. And you're going to see how much you got and how much you missed. Normally, people online aren't going to take the time to fill in a box. But if we say we're going to compare your answer to the expert answer, they will. Is it the same as having a discussion? No. But is it getting somebody to critically think through what they would do? There's also things that you can do um, with remote training where you might choose to have them work with a partner. You can go into a breakout or you could give them an assignment. So you could have an hour long setup like this where you're giving them some information. And then I could say, I want everyone to, let's go back to the sexual harassment example. Monica, I'm gonna give you a worksheet. Andrew, I'm gonna give you a worksheet. You're each gonna read the description. You're gonna fill out where you would stand in these three places. And then as a follow up to this, I want you each to get together and talk about it for 10 minutes and explain your points of view to each other. And then I want you to come back to the group tomorrow or whenever. And I want you to be pre prepared to share what you learned from that experience and, and hearing somebody else's point of view on the matter. So as you start to think creatively, there's all sorts of ways to get it done. The problem is you guys are all being put on the spot really quickly um, about something that you might not use, be used to thinking about. So it's tough. Anyway, is that what you were hoping for, Andrew? Are there comments or questions? Uh, a lot Sorry of people talking. like hearing about the, the, the thinking for transitioning between I uh, like hearing how you change from ILT to online. I think uh, one big point that you mentioned there that I want to drive home is get to know the, the capabilities of your tools. Yeah. Uh, if you don't know that you can do the red light, yellow light, green light, then you're never going to have a creative idea that's going to utilize that or you're not going to be able to transition it. So knowing the tools is very important. I think uh, uh, I'm seeing it in some of the comments here from the audience. One of the larger challenges that we may be facing is that 
we're suddenly diving into tools that we've barely used at all in the past, or suddenly everybody's using a technology that we just don't have the bandwidth to use. Uh, you know, suddenly all these VPNs are being set up. Um, all, uh, all kinds of things are being, there's IT uh, teams that are just losing their heads over the amount of work that they need to do to transition everybody to be able to work from home. Um, and knowing your limits, knowing what you can and can't utilize uh, will help you be more effective in that, in that vein. Um, there was a specific question along this line. Do you have any ideas to get participants up and moving during a uh, session? For the purposes of blood well, flow? I mean, or... could, yeah, maybe you're taking a health course. Do 10 push-ups. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but how do you, I mean, especially, and, I, I and we've seen questions. this, is, it goes all along also with what Colin was saying earlier, is that as you're d training people, as well as just meeting with people, we need to make, make sure people can stand up if they need to every once in a while. They need to make sure they can, that they're taking care of themselves and that they're not just stuck. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm imagining that maybe the person who wrote that is, is charged with doing full days of training, potentially online, where people are really having to sit for, for long periods of time. And so, um, you know, my role in the classroom was always every hour and 15 to hour and a half, I would give those people a break. Um, that's what I would do in the classroom. And we always had the rule, too, that you could stand up whenever you wanted. So if you're getting sleepy and, you're, you know, and these are, again, norms and expectations that you set at the outset. So everybody knows, you know what, you need to go get a glass of water. If you need to stand up, totally fine. I can see you and I can see that you're doing it, but we know why you're doing it. I think there's also opportunities that you could take. So, for example, let's go back to the, the example of Monica and Andrew filling out the worksheet. I could say, I want you to leave. I want you to go somewhere else in your house and you're going to take five to seven minutes to do this. I want you to try to do a flight of stairs and go somewhere else and take five to seven minutes to do this. And then I want you to come back and you can look for little opportunities when they don't need to see or they're not having a discussion or they're not. Those could be opportunities to get them up and moving and out and doing something different. You could even, um, you know, have breaks where, and I don't know, people have their laptops or whatever, you know, show us what's outside your front window right now or which would require them to get up and move, have kind of a fun. There's fun virtual icebreakers that you could do, too, that are a little different than what you get to do in ILT. And people could show you kind of the challenges they have with their home setup or anyway. Um, but I think those are good opportunities to get them up and moving. Great ideas. Anything uh, else for Monica, Stephanie, Colin? So um, I guess it was probably about two years ago, um, I was working with a large uh, credit card organization and um, they were moving all of their ILT over to a virtual environment. And similar to this question, um, one of the things that um, we worked on together was, so they were using Adobe Connect. Um, and Adobe Connect has multiple breakout rooms, um, like many of the other tools. And one of the things that we did was um, uh, we created um, scenarios, right? So they were actual, you know, videos um, of two people having a conversation, of having a difficult conversation. Um, but, but how it was actually used, though, was um, the instructor would send everyone a link uh, to their mobile phone um, and of course you know this is um, if it's whether or not it's possible in your organization but nonetheless um, when signing up for this particular class you had to provide your your mobile number um, uh, and it was really just used for this purpose of having this extra space of learning where it was designed to get your eyes away from um the computer uh and it was meant to be taken on your phone and the point was to watch this scenario uh and then they would come back in seven minutes um and they would join a specific breakout room um and it was actually done really quite simply um it, and they they actually used a storyline template Right. Um, so they built it quickly in a storyline template. And, you know, if you in these days, you know, um, it's pretty much um, uh, guaranteed to run on, you know, any mobile phone. So 
so they 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 used it in this very limited way, but they wound up building it out so that way um, afterwards there was continued there's additional scenarios, right? But the point was, you know, for the next seven minutes, uh, grab your phones. I'm going to send you this. Everyone received that. It was basically a link. They opened it up. It wasn't on an LMS, right? It was it was just you know on one of their I think it was a SharePoint server if I remember correctly. Um, and the point was to walk away, move, review this think about something and then um, come back, meet me back here in seven minutes. And, you know, we're going to join these different breakout rooms. And then each breakout room had an individual that was responsible for a set of questions to prompt all the other learners through their thoughts on the scenario that they just watched. And again, I, I would... I would also go back just to the idea of communicating and setting expectations. So when we're thinking about ILT, it's understood I have these people in a room and I'm going to have to take breaks because they're going to have to take breaks. But I think that there's something that happens when we shift things to online trainings and we just assume, oh, well, people will get up and, and if they need to go leave the room to take a phone call, they will. And yet, if that's not communicated, if because it's very new, that expectation isn't set, then I think that's where we have kind of people just trying to work through these courses, um, perhaps if it's an ILT that now turns into hours of e-learning. They're trying to work through it as quickly as possible. I think it's important for the organization to set expectations um, for how does this need to be completed or for the e-learning itself to work in those breaks so we're not having people sit for hours on end. Things that we know when we are, are working in ILT, um, but that maybe don't get brought over as effectively when it comes to e-learning. I think these are great thoughts, and and uh, we've I've got another question for you guys. But before, uh, I want to make sure that we don't run out of time, and I want to talk about this. So in the chat, in the global chat, not in the the questions panel, um, I've sent a link to Misty's ILT e-learning blog, ILT2 e-learning blog, and it looks like that link didn't work. Let me paste it again here. Um, but I also put in some links to. Uh, this last week, in fact, Stephanie, do you want to do you want to kind of outline our free uh, e-learning packs that I've posted there? Absolutely. So we have put together a bundle of some different assets from all of our e-learning libraries that we have. They are completely free to you. So it includes one course starter, and a course starter is a bundle of different templates, layouts, interactions, uh, quiz that's already built for you. So it's everything you need to create a quiz, uh, an entire course super quickly, um, very professionally designed. People will be very impressed when you publish this. And then it also includes four different cutout characters. These are great for creating conversational scenarios and different like simulations, and engaging your learners more. And then I think that's, I think that's, uh, there's, some, there's icons that match the course starters. So you have everything, um, that goes together and creates a course very quickly, completely free. And the files are available for PowerPoint, Lectora, Storyline, and Captivate. So whatever tool you use, they're there. Andrew posted the link in the chat, and you can get those on our website. Yeah, so so you guys can find those. I also shared a link to uh, another thing that went live yesterday, free remote work training. So we put together several courses, and we're still adding courses into this. Um, and it's free. So it's a whole set of courses that are that are free and they're already being managed by our LMS uh, knowledge link. So uh, you just sign up and boom, you have access to all of those courses and you can even add team members to that so that you can take, uh, have your whole team take those courses um, that are all about, uh, you know, how to be more productive at home. They talk about a lot of the stuff we've talked about here, um, keeping communication flowing, uh, staying healthy, and that's that link is in there as well. Um, I will also share all three of these in the email later today that goes out with the recording, and we'll get it in the um, the the blog recap, the the wrap up. I also want to share uh, one other thing from my screen. So uh, let's see if you guys are seeing that right. Yep. Okay. So some of the courses that are in the the free learning that I just talked about, 
are part of the schedule, uh, sorry, part of our off the shelf training. Uh, we have this huge library uh, with loads of pre-made courses. So if you are don't you don't necessarily want to convert your ILT over because that's just going to take so much time. You need training now. We've got pre-made courses that are ready to go. And if you need help getting those uh, loaded into an LMS ready for deployment, we can help you with that as well. Um, and of course, our custom team, if you really just let, you really just need your ILT taken care of, our custom team can help you convert ILT to, um, to virtual. We've got a quick convert tool that's really, really cool, and uh, our custom team can handle a lot of that. Colin, our, do we do a lot of conversion stuff? Do we have the, the capacity to handle that right now? Oh my goodness. Uh, conversions are just really on everyone's mind, you know, at the moment. And for really for a handful of different reasons, not only is it for, you know, ILT to another digital format, right, which could very well be a virtual environment. It could very well be e-learning, but, you know, it's, uh, it's 2020, right? And so we know that that flash is going away. There's also this rush to take those flash assets, those, um, those legacy assets and convert them uh, to an HTML, HTML5 uh, type of environment. So yeah, doing an awful lot of conversion. Awesome, I'm seeing somebody uh, here wanting to get into those courses. They've already registered, but they're not seeing them. So uh, if you guys are having, if there's any trouble, if you've registered for these courses and you're having trouble, please reach out to either your account executive or you can send me an email uh, at atownsend.elearningbuzz.com or respond to any of the emails in regards to this uh, session, this webinar, and we can we can help take care of that. Um, so the the last question for this uh, this session that I'll that I'll pose to our audience is, Let's say in three months, there's no more issues or anything. And I know I might be just wishful thinking, but sometime down the road, do you think that there's going to be a lot of people that stay working from home? Do you think working from home is, is uh, that we should get really, really used to it, figure out how to get comfortable working from home? I mean, all of you will, because you're all remote. But <laughs> I know that um, all the audience will do the same thing. I'll say from my experience, my husband loves it. He, for a lot of the reasons Colin was mentioning at the very beginning, like the lack of a commute, he has so much more time back in his day. He feels so much more productive with less distractions. Um, I'm concerned that I'm never gonna get rid of him now. So real problem, but he is loving it. So I think he's definitely considering even just like one day a week in the future. Some of the uh, audience responses, not my company. My company will definitely have to go back to work, says one person. Another person says yes. Another person says, I certainly hope so. Um, and, uh, and another person is echoing some of the thoughts that I've had uh, in conversations with people that I think some companies are going to be shocked at how much money they save by, prefer by permitting this sort of flexibility uh, that, that you, know, you, don't, you don't need as large of an office space if you're going to allow for a large amount of people to, to stay from home. Um, but, and, and, and there's kind of been a trend over the last couple of years to try to get, to allow people to work from home. And the allowance of remote workers, um, I mean, all four of you are in, in different states. And that is something that technology has really allowed us to do, where we're all in different states and we're able to come together and work. And, and uh, if everybody's just used to working from home, that may become even more and more normal. Uh, another comment, our organization went from 5% or less employees teleworking to nearly 90% in a very short period of time. And I definitely imagine the percentage will be greater than 5% in the after. Any other thoughts on that? I think there's this general concern about productivity. And I think as we've had this experience and more workers are finding ways to be productive to accomplish what they need to in a home setting, and companies are seeing that, I think a lot more companies are going to be more willing to make that adjustment. Before, perhaps there wasn't that push to, and there was that greater concern that kept them from trying to make that switch. And now I think that we've, if we're seeing that it's effective as we have seen, then that's something that's going to be much more prevalent. Yeah, I would agree. I think that this is probably, um, in the end, going to be a, a really great trial period for a lot of organizations. Um, uh, I have to believe that there's probably a handful of different 
network traffic slash call it working metrics, right? That, that they'll be able to take a look at. And of course, you know, um, any sort of uh, output uh, as the time goes by. But, you know, myself, I do hope um, that it, that would be a great opportunity for, for organizations to look deeply at it and get their employees, you know, feedback as to what they thought. Um, it, it, it takes a bit of time, you know, um, you do need to change uh, a lot of things. Um, and, uh, but I just see, you know, such great benefits um, in the remote environment. There's a great comment here. I used to love working from home, but I didn't have my kids at home working with me. Parenting slash teaching slash working is a difficult challenge. So maybe <laughs> after all of this and the kids go back to school, we're going to go, oh my gosh, working from home is a breeze when there's no children here. <laughs> this is no problem. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm also seeing um, there's a fear of decreased productivity when you have an at-home workforce, but um, a lot of information points to having an increased productivity, uh, sometimes to the detriment of the worker. Uh, for example, if I'm working at home and then it's suddenly 7 o'clock at night and I get a text, hey, there's something wrong, um, previously I would have said, okay, well, I'll tackle that tomorrow. But now I'm like, okay, I can open up my computer and take care of that now. And so you might find yourself working way more uh, and so figuring out how to draw the line somewhere and say, you know, I'm, I know I'm, I'm at my office, but I'm not in the office in my mind. So, you know, you need to separate that out. Um, there's a comment here. Try it with six adults in the house, four adult kids, and three of us are working from home. That's just, it's a wild time. It's a wild time. Everybody. It's going to be okay. So though. much family bonding there. <laughs> Well, that's what I was going to say is, uh, you know, I was just talking with my husband about this the other day because a lot of companies still are very anti-work from home. And I thought, gosh, what a great opportunity. But I thought, oh, but the kids, <laughs> you know, people are there trying to educate their kids. And so it's not an ideal situation to truly test out for a lot of people what working from home would be like. And I think my encouragement to people who are trying to prove to their organization that this is something maybe you're not going to be a full-time remote worker but you'd like to have the flexibility to telecommute occasionally or once a week um, this is your time to show them that you can do just as much or more unfortunately it is with maybe some of those other concerns and so that kind of comes back to that subject of discipline and if i could i know we've got 60 seconds left but some of the things that people struggle with a lot is the separation of work and home and you do have the flexibility to still be with your kids. I mean, if you can get up early and get get something in and then maybe you can have an extended lunch with them and visit with them and let them get everything out and go on a walk. And because you do have, I mean, it allows you to flex a little bit more. I use a timer. I time everything that I do. I didn't used to have to do that because I was very rigid about when I worked so that I could separate work from home. But now I use a timer and I time all my tasks and that helps me two ways. One, it helps me make sure that I'm not short changing my employer, that I know how much work I've put in in a day, but it also helps me make sure that I'm not short changing me. And I, oh, you know, even just yesterday, I was surprised at how much I worked and I thought, you know what? No, I'm gonna close the computer, I'm done for today. I'm gonna be home now. So there's kind of that, the physical stuff that we talked about, but there's also um, having the discipline to make sure that you're putting it in, that you're hitting your deadlines, um, and that you have an accurate idea of how much time you've put in each day so that you can continue to maintain that separation and hopefully show your employer that, you know what, this can be done and then have those options still available to you when this is all over. I can just see you fixing a scraped knee on a child and the kid saying, hurry, mom, the timer's going to run out before you get it fixed. <laughs> oh, every time my kid, like, so I have a two-year-old that I work from home with full time. So, um, yeah, every time she wants a fruit snack, I have to pause my timer. <laughs> Okay, let's get a fruit snack. Let, okay. pause, let, mama, let mama pause her timer, but it does help me know where I'm at. Excellent. All right, I everybody's very busy, and we're going to be respectful of your time. It is now 12 o'clock. We're going to end the webinar. If you guys have more questions, please reach out to us uh, at info at elearningbuilders.com. That information is there on the screen. You can always just reply to any email that was in regards to this webinar, and we'll be happy to to try to solve your training problems and maybe help you be more ergonomic and, and healthy when you work and do it at home as well. Thanks everybody on the panel as well, and we hope to see you guys all next time. Bye-bye. I know. Bye.